Welcome to the video, your first video for statics. Um, this video covers vectors. It should be a review for you from previous courses, but we want to make sure that everyone's on the same page as we get started discussing forces, which are vectors. So we're going to start by defining what a vector is versus a scalar. So a vector is any quantity defined by a magnitude and a direction. Okay, so examples of this, examples of this include force, velocity, and acceleration. And force is what we're going to be mostly dealing with in this course. On the other hand, a scalar is any quantity defined by magnitude only. Okay, so only a magnitude. Examples of this are temperature and mass. So that's the difference between a vector and a scalar. And in this course in statics, we're going to be mostly dealing with vector quantities. So we want to spend a few minutes here reviewing some of the math concepts used um, with vectors. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit more about the chair demo that was done in class on the first day. So let's think about that chair demo for a minute. So we did this twice. First we had the chair and a student pulled it along one direction, maybe something like this, and so we're going to call that direction P. And we were able to see what happened when we pulled along with some given force, with only one force. It went, this, the chair moved the same way as that force. Then we did it again using a different student pulling at a different magnitude in a different direction. And then a third time where we had both P and Q and we were able to observe or conjecture about what would happen if those both forces were applied at the same time. So now I'm going to sort of simplify the problem and call, rather than have this chair, I'm going to represent it as just a particle. So here's some particle A and I pull on it with both force P and force Q. And when I do that, I can also draw the resultant of these, which I'm gonna call R. So we have a new force shown here, R, which represents the resultant of P and Q. So this is sort of what would happen if we added those forces together. And I'm gonna define these terms a little bit better for you. So I'm gonna tell you that R is the resultant. And what a resultant is, is if you have two or more forces, or really any type of vector, but we're dealing with forces, so I'll call them forces, acting at a point, let's say point A, there is some force R that has the same effect as the original forces. So rather than pulling, having two students pull along the line of action of P and Q, I could instead have one student pull at this greater magnitude R along this other direction. So I can write that in math form as R is equal to P plus Q. Okay. And additionally, I can call P and Q the components of R. So P and Q are components of R. And what are components? Components are two or more forces that together have the same effect as the original force. So in this case, when I look at this equation right here, the R equals P plus Q, if I start with the force R, I can resolve it, I call it resolve it when I find the components, into two forces, P and Q, that when added together have the same effect. Or I could start with my two forces, P and Q, and find the resultant of the two forces.
So we have the resultant and the components. When I start with the force and find its components, what I'm doing is called resolving the force into its components. We can simplify components by finding rectangular components. So um, when I found the components, when I said over here that P and Q were the components of R, these components, any arbitrary set of vectors that add up together to one vector, do not need to be perpendicular to each other. They don't have to be on any given set of directions. There could be even more than two. But we can simplify things if we find rectangular components. And so when we find rectangular components, what we're doing is resolving a force into two, or a vector, into two components that are perpendicular to each other and parallel to the x and y axes. So if I have some point, if I have some vector a that acts in this coordinate system defined here by x and y, here, x and y and a vector a, I can resolve this into two components ax and ay, which act along the x and y axes, and then I can write a equals ax plus ay. So that is rectangular components. I'm going to now define a unit vector. So a unit vector is a vector with a magnitude of 1 that defines a direction. We're going to work a lot with unit vectors this quarter. And unit vectors are really a convenient way to express a vector that has a particular direction. So unit vector is kind of helpful in finding, defining that part of um, a vector that help makes it a vector, that is its direction. Okay, so if I have some vector u and its magnitude, which I write as u with these two bars on it. So if you see me, any one of your professor writing with a vector with sort of like absolute values, that means just its magnitude. So it doesn't really necessarily have to have a direction associated with it. And I'm going to also define this vector e that has a magnitude of 1 which makes it a unit vector. So given the unit vector E and the vector U with the same direction, so these two vectors act along the same line of action, I can write U is equal to the magnitude of the vector times that unit vector E. So then I can draw this as U sorry about that, so I can draw that as u times e. So these two figures here sort of represent the same thing. So I'm going to bring these last two concepts, the rectangular components and the unit vectors together and define Cartesian unit vectors. So these are a special set of unit vectors. And these unit vectors act in the direction of the positive coordinate system. So if I draw a three-dimensional, in this case, coordinate system that has x, y, and z, and we'll discuss three-dimensional vectors and coordinate systems in details next week. So for now, I'm just using it to define the Cartesian unit vectors. Then I have these three unit vectors that act along the same line of action as these three coordinates, and they are i, j, and k. So i is the unit vector along the positive x-axis. j is the unit vector along the positive y-axis. And k is the unit vector along the positive z-axis. Okay? So... Now I'm going to bring all this vector stuff together and do a detailed example. So in this example, I'm going to add two vectors. 
using Cartesian units. Okay, so here is the problem we're going to do. I have these two vectors. The first one is F1, and it's 800 newtons, and it's up in the um, positive x, positive y quadrant. And then F2 is 408 newtons acting in the fourth quadrant here, positive x, negative y. And so these have magnitudes given by the 800 newtons for F1, the 408 newtons for F2, and their direction is defined using the this triangle give, by giving the x and y of the triangle. Okay, so so we'll come back to that when we need it. So I'm trying to find the magnitude and the direction of the resultant force. So adding these two forces together to get some new force, FR, that has the same impact as point O. And I'm going to use Cartesian units to do this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to break the two forces into their X and Y components. So I'll start with F1, the 800 Newton force, and it can be represented as F1XI plus F1YJ. So again, if I find this X component here and multiply it by the unit vector that acts in the same direction, which in this case is I, then I fully defined this vector here. Then I do the same in the Y direction. So I have F1Y, multiply it by J, and I'll define the vector that runs up from the x-axis to the 800 newton. Then if I add those two components together, I have F1. So to find F1x, I'm going to take 800 newtons, the magnitude of the force, and multiply it by the sim a similar triangle. So in this case, it's going to be 4 fifths. So if I look at the geometry back up here of this triangle, I can represent this as if you reduce it, it's sort of like a three, four, five triangle. So if you remember back to geometry, this can be used as the same as like finding the cosine of the angle, okay? So the F1X is 800 newtons times four fifths, which is 640 newtons. And again, this four fifths is like the opposite, sorry, the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So the adjacent side is 4, the hypotenuse is 5, so this is the same as cosine of what would be that angle. And then F1Y is 800 newtons times 3 fifths, which is 408 newtons. I'm going to do the same thing for F2. When I do this, I need to really be careful about my direction sign, okay? So I'm going to find F2x is 408 newtons times 480 over 1020. This one, and this is 192 newtons. This one, the triangle is not as tidy, so really all I did was find the hypotenuse of a triangle that has 900 millimeters by 480 millimeters, and it's 1020 millimeters. So that's where this 1020 comes from. Okay, and then F2Y is negative 408 times 900 over 1020, which is negative 360 newtons. So I had to add in this negative sign because I can see when I draw my sketch that this Y direction is in the negative. So I'm going to summarize that F1 is 640i plus 480j newtons, and F2 is 192i minus 360j newtons. So now I have the components of each of the forces, and my next step is going to be to find the resultant force, which is going to be F1 plus F2. So here is F1 and F2. Let me just get rid of that part. So if I was going to, if I was going to determine the resultant, what I'm basically going to do is add F1 plus F2. 
which I've already broken into components. So I'm adding 640i plus 480j. To that, I'm adding 192i and a negative 360j. So I can add the like components. So I can say that this is 832i plus 120j newtons. So that's my resultant force in Cartesian units. So I'm going to draw that up on the sketch here, and you'll see that it is 832i. So that's basically 640i would be contributed from F1, and another 192 from F2. And then in the y direction, I went up 480 newtons from F1, and then down 360 from F2, which brings me to the 120. So then I can find the magnitude of this force by doing Pythagorean theorem, and I'll get 140.6 newtons, and then I can find the angle, which will be 8.21 degrees, and so now I have fully defined my force. I have both a magnitude, 860.4 newtons, and a direction, 8.21. So in the process of solving this problem, I had to first start with two forces, resolve those forces into their Cartesian vector form along the x and y axes, then I added them together to find the resultant force in Cartesian units, and once I had that, I uh, found the magnitude and direction. So that concludes this introduction to forces, I, incur I mean to vectors. I encourage you to read chapter 2 in your textbook for further discussion about vectors. Hopefully most of this is a review from previous courses. Um, we will be working with vectors all quarter, so it's important to have a really good understanding of what vectors are. All right, we'll see you in class next time.